recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Alertness webinar series. My name is Jamie Underwood, Director of Marketing Communications at Alertness Technologies. Today's session will cover best practices in the event of an active shooter. We have an excellent panel of emergency management experts from notable universities who will be discussing emergency preparedness, best practices, and protocols that are applicable for any organization or institution. We ask that you please hold all questions to the end of the webinar. However, feel free to type any questions in the chat box during the presentation, and we'll be sure to come back to those during the Q&A at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded, so please email marketing at alertus.com if you're interested in receiving video from today's webinar. I would now like to turn it over to today's webinar moderator, Alertus's Director of Professional Services, Ben Brewer. Thank you, Jamie. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Jamie mentioned, we do have an excellent panel with uh, three panelists uh, representing three very diverse uh, universities and three organizations that have deployed the Alerta system in very diverse uh, uh, aspects to uh, or very diverse uh, designs to be able to address their crisis communications strategies. And with regard to today's uh, webinar, specifically we're focusing on active shooter events. It's my distinct honor to be able to introduce these three gentlemen and moderate the discussion as the webinar progresses. We'll be starting out with uh, Mark Bagby. Uh, Mark is the Director of Emergency Management for Washington University in St. Louis. He's also an adjunct faculty member teaching emergency management at St. Louis University and an instructor for FEMA. Mark serves on the Board of Directors of the Campus Safety, Health, and Environmental Management Association and is a member of its Emergency Management Committee. In 2011, he founded and chaired the St. Louis Emergency Management University Consortium to help institutions of higher education build their emergency management plans and programs. In 2012, he was asked to serve on a national task force to develop guidelines, resources, and procedures for institutions of higher education to deal with bomb threats and campus evacuations. Mark also speaks nationally on emergency notification systems emergency communications, and emergency planning. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Bagby. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Hope everybody's staying warm out there. A little bit about uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, we're in an urban setting here in St. Louis, Missouri. We've got about 14,500 students, a little bit more than that, and employees. We've got six campuses and about 535 buildings, so we're quite spread out and have a lot of stuff to deal with. We cross uh, nine different municipal boundaries, so sometimes dealing with emergency, it, it can become interesting dealing with all those different partners. Next slide. We originally started using the DHS FBI's run, hide, fight video, but we realized uh, very quickly that there was a, an important aspect missing out of that, and that's the report portion of it. So we, had, we added that because we need people to start the law enforcement process of responding to an active shooter, and we also need to then meet our clear obligation of sending out a mass notification to the campus population. We offer one hour trainings throughout the year to all employees and students that goes over this process of run, hide, fight report. It's put on by my office in coordination with our campus police department and our protective services department at our medical campus. We also decided to create a six minute video that kind of had the wash you look and feel for active shooters. And that summarizes these steps and, and important things to do in about six to seven minutes for those that cannot commit to a full hour presentation. Next slide. We use Alertus as our centralized dashboard to activate multiple alert technologies in the event of emergency. For an active shooter uh, or a tornado warning, our police dispatchers have access to send that out as a preset alert. 
which means we've prescribed or prescripted what the message is going to be, what bells and whistles are going to go off, and to what campus populations. For active shooters, because we have six campuses, we have a specific message to each campus. So if, if there's a shooter on the Danforth campus, it states there's a, a person with a weapon on the Danforth campus. That way our, our population that's very mobile throughout the day knows where the problem is and knows to stay away from that campus. Once we have better information, then we'll send out a second notification that may list the building that the problem's in or, or the, the area on campus that we want people to avoid. Each emergency is different and may affect only one of our campuses, so we use the profiles and alert us to set up different alerting methodologies. In short, what that means is through multiple channels, we actively alert uh, the people on the campus that is affected and passively alert those that are on other campuses, again, so that they stay away from that campus. Next slide. This graphic kind of sums up how, how our alert system is set up. We use Alertus as the centralized dashboard, and then we tie multiple technologies into that Alertus dashboard, and depending on the emergency, what we set off. We have Alertus desktop pop-ups, alert beacons, text-to-speech devices uh, tied to our voice over fire alarm systems and building public address system. We have them tied to our outdoor Whalen uh, tornado sirens, so we can do a siren and or a voice message outdoors. We have cable TV override, which takes over the TVs for a full the full screen for three minutes. Digital signage override. Uh, and that was a tricky one, but we, we had to require all of our, our digital sign uh, management teams to use the same software so we can overtake that. We have a website feed through RSS that will take over our website and an API to our Everbridge system, which sends out the emails, text messages, and voice messages to personal devices. Many of our modalities are campus specific so that we can set off only devices on one campus if we want to or need to. And we utilize this most recently uh, with the Ferguson riots uh, over the past fall. One, one new feature that we're beta testing with Alertus is we have a campus app. And last Thursday, we successfully tested that on uh, iOS and Android where we can do push notifications to our campus app instead of paying for a separate mass notification app. Next slide. This is a screenshot of our emergency web page from uh, earlier this year. Uh, it's, it's very heavily utilized through an RSS feed. If you look at the green bar where it says no emergency, we can turn that to yellow or red based on the emergency uh, through an RSS feed and let people know what's going on. It's also a resource tool for more information such as violence, active shooter, and other emergencies. Uh, just over the weekend, that green bar turned yellow because we're under a winter weather warning and received six to eight inches of snow. Next slide. With alert systems comes the onus of training dispatchers and others to use it and when to use it properly. So training is a big piece of this. On February 20th of 2013, just a little over a year ago, we unfortunately had a false alarm. I was luckily in our emergency operations center, which is right next to our police dispatch center, on a national weather service call for impending winter weather. All of a sudden, my computer screen desktop pop, popped up and activated with an active shooter Danforth campus message. For about three seconds, I thought that uh, one of our IT guys was playing a trick on me and testing the system because he knew I was in there. But then I, I quickly logged into our system and saw that it was a real alert and that it had come from our dispatch center. I ran next door, and the dispatcher I met kind of in the hallway, and she exclaimed, it was me, it was me, it was an accident, uh, it's not real. So I quickly went back to the EOC and canceled the alert, sent the all clear, 
Uh, but by then, from the time it had been sent to the time I did that, almost three minutes had passed. So a lot of the campus had already been alerted to an active shooter on that campus. Uh, when we kind of did the after action review of what caused this, the dispatcher was in dispatch and trying to recertify, retrain herself on the system. We have a training program set up in Adobe Connect and it's all screenshots but it makes you feel like you're in the live system. We did this to hopefully prevent what this accidental alert occurred. Well while she was doing that she was doing her normal dispatch duties and you know, kept coming, going back and forth to it, became confused and accidentally opened up the live system while she was going through the scenario, which was an active shooter. Uh, lesson learned from that incident, now we require the dispatchers to uh, leave dispatch whenever they're retraining or recertifying and go to another room and then we have uh, a manager or an officer sit with them to make sure they don't go into the live system, that they stay in the training system. Next slide. This is just a screenshot of what our old message is versus our new message. Uh, after that we had some people, they, they just they weren't sure what to do. Uh, they didn't know if it was a tornado warning, a shooter on campus, or something else. So some people went outside, some people went to the basement, some people did the right thing and you know, locked their door, hid under their desk, turned off the lights. And so if you see the old message, it, it was a little bit vague. A potential threat to safety exists on the Danforth campus. Go to a secure location, remain there until further notice. So we created some focus groups with employees and students and came up with the new message. And now we state a person with a weapon has been reported on the affected campus. Go to a place that you feel safe and remain there until further notice. For further info, check the website. And then with the video and the in-person training, we go more in depth of what is a safe place, you know, the, the whole run, hide, fight, report uh, methodology. Well, thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Frank Zebedis. Frank is the Chief of Police at Winthrop University. Since becoming Chief of Police at Winthrop, Frank graduated from the FBI's National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and has served as both President and Vice President of the South Carolina Campus Law Enforcement Association. He is the immediate past chair of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators Domestic Preparedness Committee. Frank has also served on the Advisory Council for the Campus Safety Journal and has given several presentations on campus safety. In December of 2005, Frank was selected by the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators as an instructor to travel the country and present a three-day Homeland Security funded course on the Incident Command System or ICS. Frank has, um, Frank has since been deemed a subject matter expert on critical incident response and has assisted in developing four classes that are now being funded through Homeland Security and FEMA and taught around the country on critical incidents and response. In June of 2013, Frank was awarded a presidential award from IACLEA for his work with developing and teaching critical response courses and appointed as the IACLEA South Re Southeast Regional Director. In April of 2014, Frank was promoted to Assistant Vice President of Student Life as well as serving as the Chief of Police. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Zebedis. Thank you, Ben, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, just a little bit of uh, groundwork here about our institution here at Winthrop University. We're located in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and that is just uh, south of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, right on the border. Uh, urban campus, we have around 6,200 students uh, faculty around 543, about 418 acres and 60 buildings. Uh, we too have a notification system as well uh, utilizing the alerta system. We have a multi-tiered notification system uh, that will include uh, SMS messaging, cell phone, the alertus uh, which includes the beacons, the desktop, the digital signage and we also utilize uh, LiveSafe. It's an app that we have uh, 
partnered with, and we also use that as a means to put out our notification. But I kind of want to take a different direction here as far as the active shooter response. Not only do we do the uh, notification system, but we add an educational component for our faculty, staff, and students. And uh, this educational component that we implement kind of gives them an opportunity to learn what to do in the event there's an active shooter and they are actually stuck in that building or stuck in that classroom and what do they need to do until law enforcement responds. And all of our officers are uh, certified, they're trained in the alert uh, concept which is the advanced law enforcement rapid response training. I have two national uh, instructors on this. We have a monthly uh, training session with our city police department so we all have the same concept on how to respond, what to do. We utilize some munitions as we, as we do this training. But what we developed here at Winthrop was the notification is a great concept. The officers are being trained. But what do people do to survive in, in the event uh, it happens until we get there? So we developed this uh, protocol that we put into place in this educational concept. And during this concept, we kind of explain uh, what we expect what the university is going to do, that we are going to notify the police, we are going to do everything we can to uh, help them ensure their safety and get them out safely. Uh, one of the things that we have here at Winthrop University, and I, I think a lot of institutions have gone to this uh, over a period of time, is we've developed a critical incident management team. And this team is made up of all the disciplines on campus. And this team uh, meets once a month. We identify uh, our areas of improvement that we need. We debrief incidences. We learn from the incidences that have occurred throughout the country. And it makes us better and makes us more responsive in the event something happens. So uh, we talk to our, our, uh, our faculty and staff and students about this team, that they are involved and in what they're going to do. Uh, we also then, if you want to change slides, uh, we also talk to them about what the police priorities are, what to do, what we're going to do. And we feel this is important. A lot of people say, well, I don't share your tactics. Well, we're not sharing our tactics. We're not explaining to them what we're going to do tactically, but we are explaining to them what they're going to encounter in the event this happens, in the event that they see a police officer coming down the hall armed to help them and to save them. We want them to understand what the officer is going to tell them what the officer is going to direct them and what the officer is going to expect from them. So we give them the uh, opportunity to hear and see what we're going to do. Uh, and we talk about the neutralization of the suspect and that we're going to protect the lives and the safety of the officers and that we're going to contain the situation. You know, one of the def part of the definition of an active shooter is someone that's not contained. So we definitely want to get that situation contained and how important their information to that responding officer is going to be in finding and apprehending the proper person. Next slide. Uh, also, before I get into this slide here, one of the things that we also talk about is our contact and rescue teams. We let them know that there will be teams that will be arriving and the first team will be there coming in to uh, engage the shooter and the second team will be your rescue team. So we let them know what to expect as well. So we then get into the, uh, the meat of the presentation of the educational part of it. And our concept is, is you know, very simple. It's a get out and a call out. I want to switch it. Next slide. A hide out and a keep out concept is what we initially teach. And with each one of these steps that we teach, we give them some indication of what to expect. We give them some uh, examples. To, that educates them and then ultimately at the end we want to tell them or talk to them about the last concept if at all necessary and that's takeout and the importance of that. Uh, I think takeout is a lot of uh, a lot of discussion on that. Do we uh, promote that? Do we teach that? Do we educate people on that? And uh, it's been the consensus of our institution, been the consensus of the uh, police department here at Winthrop and our local jurisdiction that yes, we need to teach that in the event an active shooter does come into that classroom, 
or into that building. They cannot keep them out. They cannot hide, and it's inevitable that they're going to confront this individual. We do we do teach the takeout concept. Uh, it's very similar to the run hide fight that uh, Mark talked about, and uh, you know, but it's just our version of of all of that. One of the things that we have been doing too is, uh, like I said, we teach our faculty and staff, but we've taken this message to the students as well. And part of taking that message to the students is college of education is very, very uh, big uh, college here at our institution. We, we do a lot of education and as far as educators go. And before our students go out and do their field work, they have to go through one of my presentations which incorporates what I've just explained, the concept, the protocols of the get out, call out, hide out, keep out, and take out protocol. And this kind of gives them some sense of security once they get into the schools, what to expect, what, what to learn, what to look for. Uh, so many of our students, when they go into the classrooms after this, uh, you know, when it's time to go out into the field and do their field studies, They've missed the orientation with all the education to these teachers that take place at the beginning of the year. So this is kind of a reminder to them. Now we don't tell them to go against what the school policies are or protocols, but it gives them some sense of uh, understanding of what may happen and what might be expected of them as well. So uh, we feel that it's been very important. And this has been a very successful program for us here at Winthrop University since we've implemented it several years ago. Well, thank you, Chief. Our next speaker is Mr. Robert Williams. Robert has worked with California State University San Marcos for the past 18 years and has been involved in a variety of programs that have positively impacted the campus and surrounding community. Robert is currently serving as the campus emergency manager. In addition to his duties as emergency manager, Robert is also responsible for the campus continuity planning and oversees building access control and card access security. Since taking over as emergency manager, Robert has revamped an antiquated emergency alert system with a new, modern, and extremely flexible system that is able to meet the changing needs of a growing campus. He works closely with the campus community, establishing new training initiatives that are focused on building a stronger state of readiness for all types of disasters, hazards, and emergencies. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Williams. Thank you, Ben. Hi, as Ben said, I'm Robert Williams. I work at Cal State San Marcos out here in um, Southern California um, where the weather's nice. <laughs> um, I, was, I, I got in the seat about a year and a, uh, two and a half years ago, and um, one of the first things the chief um, sort of assigned me was to take a look at our um, merchant notification system. And um, as he said, it was antiquated and sort of out of, out of date. So um, we knew at that point we needed to do something, so we started looking at um, possible fixes for it. But we needed something that would integrate with what we already had on campus because we didn't we didn't obviously have the money to put in all new infrastructure. So um, we started doing conferences and different things, and we um, located Alertus, and we um, started working with them and our IT staff to try to integrate into what we already had. So we um, went on and started building our system actually in-house with our IT staff. Um, we're a suburban campus probably about 15,000 enrollment this semester actually went up. Um, about 1,900 faculty and staff on campus, 340 acres, 20 buildings. Uh, we've got two new buildings coming on um, board soon, a new um, sports arena coming on board soon. Um, they broke ground for that this year, so it should be in, in next year and a half. Um, so we're looking at how we can incorporate those into our emergency notification system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, sort of funky the way it looks. But this is our emergency notification system, Alert U. It's our um, new new system. Um, we were ha we were I guess lucky to have our IT staff get so involved with this and help us out with this. But um, we actually ended up having to buy new speakers. We put new ATI speakers out on the building and um, some um, integrated those with the Alertist. But you'll see that um, that emergency push button there on the left hand side um, when the chief tasked me with coming up with a new emergency notification system. He said it would be nice to have one button that does everything for us. So with Alertus's help and being able to tie all these systems together, we were able to put that button in dispatch and any type of active shooter incident or gunman on campus incident where we have to lock down, 
they push that button and our entire emergency notification system launches and all those things take place at once. So we got our campus outdoor speakers that will launch the message. Our desktop alerts will pop up. Digital signage will send out the message. Um, we've got all of our buildings on um, DSX system so we can lock down individual, in, individual buildings or we can lock down the entire campus via card access with that push the button also. We have um, alert beacons hooked to every building with the DSX box and it locks down the campus. Um, our library has a public address system in it and we can um, tie into that. We're currently working on a project to tie into our new student union and to our new arena that's coming on board um, soon. Um, we go. We use Mirror 3 also and they um, do our email, text and um, cell phone calls and um, it goes out to them. And then another piece, all the campus phones have um, intercoms on them. So with this system we were able to tie into and so it takes all the phones off hook and sends the message over the phones on every phone on campus if we have an uh, emergency alert go out. And then also send out a Twitter feed, um, but usually our communications department will handle the Twitter feeds and all those. But um, as you can see, it was, it was a pretty pretty big project, pretty robust project, but we think we've got a very good um, system that we've had to use several times in the last year or so. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Next slide, please. Back in um, August of last year, well, back up a step, in May of last year, we had fires that closed the campus down for um, a week. We had fires right on the back side of the campus that was um, encroaching on the campus. So we had to send an emergency alert to evacuate the campus immediately, um, shut down the campus. The campus was um, down for a week. We had to reschedule um, our commencement ceremonies. We had to, um, it was right in the middle of finals. So they had to work with their professors after that to get grades and everything done. Um, well, we got through that emergency notification system worked exactly like we had a plan and hoped. And then in August of that same last year, we got possible government on campus. Um, you can see the picture here of the, um, the first, the subject getting off the um, elevator in the parking structure, and you see the black thing coming off. He had strapped over his shoulder and under his arm and walking towards campus. And someone called University Police Dispatch and said, a possible government on campus looks like he has a long, long rifle or a long gun. Um, officers were dis, um, obviously dispatched up to the campus to try to locate him with his last um, locations. They were unable to locate the subject. At that point is when the chief decided that um, he was going to lock down the campus and start looking for potential gunmen. Um, fortunately for us, it turned out to be an umbrella, <laughs> which unusual in Southern California for anyone to have an umbrella anymore. But um, it happened to be an umbrella, and um, we locked down the campus. We were locked down for almost an hour. I got a timeline later I'll share with you. Um, and it it really showed us our tact, helped us with our tactics on the police side, and helped us with our messaging on um, on the alert side. So um, during all this, the you know the dispatchers were going through their camera feeds and trying to find photo sh shots of it, and um, that takes a little while to go through all that um, while the police officers are out there looking for the um, person. Anyway, we were able to locate the person, contact them, and they actually were trying to contact the police um, and let them know that they think that was them they were talking about. So we, we were able to get out of there all safe. But it really gave us some, some on-the-job training and really gave us some um, lessons learned that we I'll share with you in a few minutes. Um, push the alert button, mutual aid calling out. In about 20 minutes, we probably had 30 or 40, 30 to 40 officers from around the surrounding community on campus, go, headed towards our IC to take care of the, um, to start figuring out how we're going to lock down the campus and how we're going to um, maneuver the campus to start doing searches before we knew the per, before we had actual um, identity on the person. Um, next slide, please. So the emergency notifications, we sent the emergency notification out to start. The first one was um, 8.53, it was a CAN message that says lockdown, shelter in place, await further instructions. A little more detailed than that, but it just basically tells them we've got a gunman on campus or we've got an emergency on campus, lockdown, shelter in place, and await further instructions. Now one thing that we learned through after action reports from other incidents was people would complain about being locked down for long periods of time and not know what's going on or not know any status. So we made it a, a, a real effort before any of the, before this ever started 
we sort of had a game plan on how we were going to handle that. So we figured we put the CAN message out first and then at least give some update messages to start with early to let them know everything remain locked down, everything's good. We're looking for the subject, get a subject description if you need to. Um, a lot of conversation back and forth about giving away tactics. You know, if, if you got police going into a building, should you tell, let them know you're going into a building? So after the fact, we had a lot of conversations on what type of tactics or any kind of tactics we were going to give away if we, this happens again. Um, so I think now we've got a pretty good roadmap on what we're going to do, but I suggest that you definitely sit down with your tactical, your police side, your tactical side, your emergency management side, or the per persons who are going to do the messaging. Figure out who's going to do the messaging, who's going to authorize the messaging, um, what to say, any canned messages early. Um, don't give away officer tactics, obviously. Um, any kind of lessons learned type thing, um, get those down. But um, on your messaging, you want to make sure that you have something in place or a, a, a roadmap in place in your emergency operations plan or whatever that says, okay, we're going to try and send the first message. We're going to try to send subject description possibly and then update them every so often. So what we're going to do in the future of any type, type like this We'll send the initial message to lockdown. We'll send a, a status message with possibly description. And in those messages, we're going to timestamp it and say, okay, you can expect the next update to come at this time. Um, we got a lot of great feedback on the messaging. You can see ours lasted almost an hour, and we sent out four messages, with, including the all clear. But everyone's comment back to us was they knew exactly what, they felt like they knew what was going on. They felt comforted that everything was moving forward. And um, they knew what to do. Um, so that was a good good thing for us that we, we liked hearing back. But we're obviously going to improve on that next time with, um, you know, giving out messaging. Because if the person didn't self-report or we didn't know who the person was by finding him in the parking structure and getting a license plate number, um, we could have been locked down for several hours. And um, so we would have had to come up with game plans on the fly to try to figure out how we are going to message out. Now we've sort of got that in our system, in our EOP, that says, okay, we're going to message these intervals and give this information and do, try to do these things. I mean, it's a fluid operation, so you never know exactly what's going to happen, but that's what we tried to do. Um, luckily for us, like we said, it was an umbrella. We located the subject, had him come out. You can see the pictures here. This is one of the one on the le upper left is one from a classroom taken when the alert hit. They were doing a lecture, uh, went up on the lecture on screen. That's to lock down shelter in place. The one on the bottom was the IC, where the IC was set up, the incident command was set up, and you can see all the cars that responded from around the county for the um, mutual aid. Then the one on the right, which I find sort of, sort of funny, is um, you'll see the, the, the one officer in the um, camouflage shorts, and there's one right directly behind him was in, in shorts. They were on a car detail for the county doing stolen cars operations and they got the call and they came on the campus put on their gear and here they were so but that's when they pulled the gentleman out of the building checked it checked his office and got every went through the protocols to clear everything and that's when we were able to now be all clear but um just lessons learned that we found in your EOP when you have your all hazard sort of training and all hazard um, protocols you know Prior to an event like this, try to identify spots on campus that you can set up your IC that are sort of safe out of the out of firing range if the person does have a weapon. Um, just food for thought. Um, protocols and reporting in. When you got those officers reporting in for mutual aid, where are you going to send them? You're going to send them to the IC where they know where the IC is at. Try to make those ICs where people know where they at and get that information out to your local agencies. Um, protocols for closing the campus. You know, you close off the entrances. We're lucky here. We got three entrances in and off the campus. It's pretty easy to close down the campus as far as vehicle traffic. Um, the pro protocols for that. Who's going to take care of that? How are you going to handle that? How are you going to close those things off? Um, witness staging. If you have an incident on campus, that's actually a real incident, and you've got witnesses, where are you going to stage the witnesses? Um, clearance areas. Where are you going to take people as you clear the buildings? Are you going to get them off campus? Or are you going to stage them somewhere? Um, and then reunification areas. If you have an incident, what kind of reunification areas are you going to have set up? Is it going to be off campus? Is it going to be on campus? These are just things to keep in mind because we learned a lot of these things when we started saying, okay, what if this would have really happened? And what if this would have happened? What would that happen? Um, start looking at your counseling services. Do you have contracts with the, with the surrounding community 
for additional counseling services. Because most campuses, you, you can't support that type of an event. So you need to work with your city and your counties to make sure you have counseling services identified that can come in to help you if it, in an event like this. But um, I think that's all of my slides. And um, so we'll open it up for questions, I guess. Ben, is that correct? And thank you, Robert. I um, appreciate all three of you gentlemen sharing your insights into how you went about planning and, and getting your system put in place to support these types of, uh, of incidents and events. As Robert mentioned, uh, we're definitely at the, the question and answer uh, portion of our webinar. If you would, if you're interested in some submitting a question, please use the chat box uh, to type in and submit the question. If you want to address it to one of our panelists, uh, specifically either Mark Frank or Robert, uh, please just let us know in that chat box uh, who you would like to address that question and we'll, we'll be happy to get that in front of them. Um, we do have several that have been submitted already and Mark, we'll, we'll go ahead and start with you. Um, one, of the, one of the points that uh, you brought out very early in your presentation is that uh, you have, uh, the way your campus is laid out is spread out across nine municipal boundaries. Um, You've got six six campuses, which obviously necessitates an awful lot of work with with regard to getting memorandums of understanding and agreement in place. And um, this particular individual is is wondering if you have any recommendations on how best to go about fostering synergies um, between your active shooter plans and other response plans, um, and working those you know with other uh, members of the local community that that may be impacted by those events or that may be called upon um, to support you as your campus uh, endeavors to respond to those incidents? Yeah, good question, Ben. So first, we're, we're lucky here in Missouri that the state, uh, I think it was kind of after the, um, the Sandy Hook meetings, the state manda mandated a program for all law enforcement officers called the uh, MTAC. And so all officers in the state are trained to the same standard in responding to an active shooter situation. What we do is with our different municipalities is, you know, whenever we have, you know, a, a house or apartment we're going to tear it down, uh, we have one of our campus, our south campus, that part of it's not utilized. So we open that up and at the time do trainings with those different uh, community partners. Uh, nice thing is it's, you know, a lot of uh, school setting. So it allows them to go in with some munitions and stuff like that and run through those scenarios and work hand in hand in uh, responding to emergency. The second thing we do is when we have special events such as the Fourth of July, Can you hear me, Ben? Mark, this is Ben. We, I think we had a, a little technical difficulty here in Beltsville. We, we kind of lost audio there for a few moments. But um, are you still with us uh, as far as picture and able to see everything? I am. Okay. Robert, I am. Frank is as well. Okay. Frank, Robert, were you guys able to hear Mark all the way through his response? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, that's good. At least it was just local to, to us here in Bellsville. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it, and, and we appreciate you all hanging in with us out there. We have uh, we think we've got it resolved here on our end. Uh, Frank, the next question that we received is for you, and um, the 
the question addresses uh, your system and the way you you have it um, uh, designed and, and architected and, and deployed across your university. Um, how do you go about testing your system? Um, we obviously saw a good little uh, piece of, of how you train new students as they come on board and, and get them familiar with uh, um, you know the fact that this system is there and, and how and why it would be used and how they'd be expected to uh, respond. But how do you how do you go about testing it to ensure that that effectiveness um, you know is maintained? Right, right. Well, as far as our alertus system, our beacons, we test those monthly. We run a monthly test on the beacon on the beacons uh, to ensure that they're they're working. And then uh, once a semester, we test the entire system. And we have something here called study day. It's always the day before uh, exams begin. And when we do that, we have a full-blown test. We test the whole system that we have, the, the cell phone system, the, the text messaging system, all the pop-ups that we have on our message boards and on our computers. And then we do that twice a year, uh, once each semester and then once in the summertime. So I guess that all three semesters we test uh, just to ensure that they're they're being uh, uh, utilized and they're also working properly. Uh, also, we've unfortunately had some experiences the past year that we've we've utilized our system uh, more than we wanted to for various reasons. Uh, so therefore, we know that it's working. Uh, we run tests on it to make sure that the people are getting the, the response that they are. And believe me, if, if there's been a notification and they haven't gotten it, we hear from them. So the fact that we are able to utilize the system helps us with the testing process as well. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Robert, I have one for you as well. Um, what, early on in your presentation, you mentioned that you were very fortunate to have IT on board earlier, uh, earlier in the, uh, the process. And the question that came in for you was uh, if you had any recommendations, best practices to um, achieve and, and attain that key stakeholder buy-in early in the process, and what in particular did you feel were some of the, the more tangible effects of having those stakeholders involved uh, earlier in the process? Well, I, there are consultants out there, consulting firms that will come in and do the whole thing for you, but they charge a lot of money, and I knew our campus didn't have that kind of funding. So I got went to the, um, the dean of our IITS and, and sat down and talked to him and told him the importance of having this emergency notification system. Luckily for us, he gets it. His whole IT staff gets it, um, and it was sort of a push down. Um, so he assigned me an IT person and, well, actually an IT team, a couple guys, um, to work with me through this process. And we went through the process and identified what pieces we wanted to keep, what pieces we needed to refresh or renew, and what pieces that we could add to the system to make it a, a whole. Um, like I said, we work with IT closely on this one. Um, they funded it pretty much all their salaries through them. We didn't have to give them any money you know, up front for salaries or anything like that. And we were able to make that, that connection with them. And the project managers we got that worked with us were just fantastic. They, they really wanted to get this thing up and running and they had real buy-in on it and they had sort of a sense of pride to let's, let's do this and make it work. Um, so I think the, the big thing is just you know get your VPs and your president in, involved and then work with your dean of whoever your IT staff is and try to get them involved. And it made it a lot easier because the Alertus technical staff gave us tons of information and we were able to tie these pieces together and it made it so much easier for us. Any other questions? Ben, can hey, I thank you, Robert. comment on, follow up with that? You most certainly do. We, uh, we implemented our alert system in uh, 2008, August 2008, following the Virginia Tech uh, incident. And I actually sought out Jason Volk at a IACLEA conference. Uh, I knew that uh, we needed to do something to uh, enhance our notification system. Uh, everybody was getting on board with the with the cell phone notification and the text notification, but I thought we needed more. And it was an easy sell. I think as Robert said, it, it was a push down from the top. Uh, that was the same thing here. If you can get your administration, president, dean, whomever to buy into it, money does not become an issue when you start dealing with lives and, and safety. 
And uh, you know, this system is is great because it's 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 an all hazard system. It's not just an active shooter system. And I think we get hung up too much on one type of incident. And we have to look at an all hazards approach. So when we sold this to our administration, we sold it as an all hazards approach. Now, obviously, at that time, the active shooting incident had just occurred at at Virginia Tech, so that's what was on everybody's mind. But we have since utilized it for several other things other than an active shooter, obviously, and uh, it's been very successful. And I think every time we use it and it's successful, it makes the buy-in easier to sell, especially if you have a change in administration. Uh, we were fortunate. Our university gave us money. They, they gave the critical incident management team money to go out and make this purchase. They give us recurring funds to keep the system in place. But as, as Robert said, buy-in from the top was important. And I think being proactive to go out and find a good system is, is important. And, and that's what we did, and it's been beneficial for us. Ben, also, if this is Robert again, I just want to tell I made it. I was jokingly with our administration saying that, you know, you can either write me a check now or you can write a much bigger one later if something happens. But that's sort of the ongoing joke with our system is we gave you the money to do it now. So. I would think at that point even even jokingly offered would resonate, uh, especially in today's environment, definitely. Thank you both for uh, your responses there. Uh, Mark, a question came in for you. Um, the attendee would like to know if you find it more useful to have a general message on alertus rather than a specific one and then refer the, uh, the intended recipient to your website for updates? Well, so you know, we, we try to get as specific as possible uh, you know, from the get-go, but with something like an active shooter, you know, until law enforcement gets there to pin down, uh, you may have to be a little bit more general. And so that's why we then follow it up with more specific information. And depending on the situation, you know, we may use the full suite of our alert system to send out that second or third message. Um, or, you know, we may just use a few of those, but we always use the website because parents and others have access to that, whereas they don't to the rest of our alert system. And then tied with that, um, you know, you don't want to just send out an alert and then just push them to the website because not everyone will have access to the website. You know, in the event of a tornado warning, for instance, there's some of our basement areas that don't have Wi-Fi or cellular access. So by, you know, posting all clear just to the website, those people would not have access to that. So that's why you really need to keep your system multimodal, push the message out through multiple modes of communication uh, as much as possible. Ben, this, this is Frank. Uh, one of the things that we try to do with our alerts initially is short and concise. You're dealing with a limited amount of characters, and you want the, those people receiving that message to see it, understand it, and respond to it. So we want to get them what is critical immediately to get them to a safe location or to respond according to what we want them to do. We don't want it to carry on too long. And, and like Mark said, referring them to a website might be okay later on, but initially, you've got to make sure that they're getting to a position or a place where they're safe, and they might not have access to a website. Excellent. Very good point, Frank. Frank, the, uh, the next question is for you, sir, and it speaks to the training that you provide uh, for your students. And they were wondering if you, if you leverage the same training materials um, across your organization, i.e. using the same training materials for students uh, faculty and staff, or do you have different materials that you use for different uh, audiences? No, we it's it's one message. Same message is being conveyed to the students, is being conveyed to the faculty and to the staff. Uh, the situation they're going to be in, it's going to be the same situation. We don't need to send mixed messages and teach them different things. So we convey the same message across the board. Everybody's learning the same. Everybody's training the same. It's just like, I, I think it was Mark who said in St. Louis, all their officers are trained how to respond. In our, in our county, we're all trained to respond the same way. We want those that are impacted to
to be able to respond the same way as well. Thank you, Chief. Here's another one for for you as well, Chief. Um, the question is, how do you get buy-in from the from the critical incident management team to meet as regularly as you do? Well, I think this again goes from the top down. Uh, the vice president of student life is the convener and also the chief executive officer for the critical incident management team. I work in the Division of Student Life and of course then I, I'm next in command to, to run the critical incident management team. Now I have control over incidences as they occur. I have the authority to you know, send out notifications and whatnot. But again, I think this is driven from the top down. We've had a couple incidences on campus. Uh, one in particular was, was a fire that impacted three buildings. Uh, the administration, the president, the vice president of the critical incident management team, when this occurred, they were both off campus, could not get back. And the team, because we assembled frequently, we knew our roles. Everybody knew their roles. They knew who was in charge. We saw the benefits of, of how we prepared for that, how we responded for that, and how we recovered from that. And I think that alone was a big selling factor to keep this team continually meeting to stay up on what was going on. We had a couple incidences in, in South Carolina over the past two weeks and our team just met and one of the things that we talked about, we debriefed each one of those situations and uh, that's some of the things that we do do is debrief what is going on around the country to see if it was us, how would we respond. If we never met when it happened here, and I don't say if it happened here, I say when it happens here, we'll make the same mistakes that maybe our colleagues made that could have saved lives down the road. So I think it's important that you you get the buy-in from the top, you show that you're worth what you say you are, and you provide good results when you're called upon to, you know, come game time. And it's a self-seller, I think. Thanks, Chief. Um, Robert, I, I'd kind of like to get your thoughts on that as well. And Mark, we'll follow up with you. Um, after Robert, if that's all right. I think I think Chief gets it, puts it out there exactly like we do. We offer um, we have a thing here at U Hour every every Tuesday and Thursday. They have a U Hour from 12 to 12:50. We have classes every week that we offer. You know, active shooter training, safety training, different types, but mainly active shooter. But we invite faculty, staff, students, whoever wants to come and and, and join us. And um, we do that every, all 16 weeks of the semester. New employee orientation, we hit all new employees, all new faculty, um, student um, orientations. So we try to have someone there presenting during student orientation. So we get the message out about our training and you know, especially the active shooter portion because that's, that's, that's the big one. I mean, out here we have a lot of earthquakes. What are you gonna, you're gonna send a message out saying we just had an earthquake and they're gonna go, yeah, really. Um, but we, um, we get the message out about active shooter, but like Chief said, it's an all hazard um, system. You know, we you got to get that buy-in to get the system out there and, and show that it works. Like we had the fires, we evacuated the campus, we were able to message out, we were able to get that information out. Active shooter situation, we were able to get the um, message out. Everyone knew exactly what to do. No, well, not everyone, but most of the people on campus knew what to do. And that comes from training. You just got to get people on board, get them trained, get them spun up, show them that you know that they matter and you care about it and hopefully they'll get on board with it. Thanks Robert. Mark, how about you? Yeah, uh, you know, with your crisis management team or, or similar to what, what you call them, you know, one, you have to be involved in the makeup of it and make sure you have the right people uh, my boss and I co-chair ours and have for since 2000, uh, I guess 2010, and you know in that time we've had to replace a couple people because they weren't, you know, working out, weren't coming to the, the trainings and meetings. Here at WashU, we bring ours together four times a year. Three of those for an hour and a half, we put them through an exercise, a, a tabletop or a functional. And you know we just switch it up. Sometimes it's a nat natural uh, natural disaster. Sometimes it's you know a, a bomb threat or uh, 
you know, a student protest. And that helps them build their skills and makes each department understand what the response would be from the other department. And, you know, we just throw questions in there and make sure that we engage those folks so it's not always the police chief and myself and, you know, residential life answering it. You know, so you really got to get them, get them involved. And this really played into our favor for the, for the Ferguson riots. We, from August to November, we met twice a week uh, during that to, you know, come up with our game plans for the different scenarios uh, during the riots and leading up to the grand jury announcement. And it was kind of a little pat on the back uh, when we did the after action review of a couple of people stating that, you know, you know, you always get up there and you talk about this or that. And, you know, this really made it real. And without all this previous training, I don't know that we would have, you know, done as well as we did with it. Ben, this is Frank. If I can make a comment. You bet, Chief. Go ahead. Uh, just kind of following up on something Mark Mark brought up. He brought up a great point that it's not always him being the emergency manager or the chief that should be in charge. I think that's important for those that understand that are out there listening is that, you know, we're experts in our field. We're not experts in every field. And if it's a resident's life issue or if it's an IT issue, uh, I'm going to turn to them. And they may be they may be put into the into the the role as the incident commander or they might be in charge of running the unified command. It's not always a police concept or a fire issue or EMS issue that's going to bring down your campus. I know an IT issue would destroy every campus on in, in this country and I look to my IT guys and I take their lead so I think it's important that when you do train and when you do bring your folks together that you get everybody involved so they understand at any time they could step up and take the lead role in an incident. That's a very good point, Chief. Thank you for sharing. Um, Mark, one, one final question for you. Uh, it, it speaks to your, to your run, hide, fight uh, report training. And the attendee was curious, what type of marketing techniques do you all use on campus to, to garner and maintain interest in that training? So it's multifaceted. Uh, first off, we reach out to our different campus partners that have their own newsletters, uh, human resources, alumni development, student union. Uh, we have our, our on-campus paper, The Record. So we, we post that out through there. Uh, on our website, we have a training calendar. Um, for employees, they have to sign up so it becomes part of their uh, employee record. So anytime they go into the training section of our HR system, if there's an open class, it's posted there. And then just other things like you know resource fairs, orientations. You know we go out there and you know have our little you know message boards and stuff and handouts and. You know, a couple little tchotchkes, you know, we use, uh, we have a stress ball that says run, hide, fight, and the emergency number is to call. And so, you know, it just kind of puts it out there for people to think about. And then we also have, uh, through the departments, we have emergency preparedness coordinators. Some people call them like floor or building wardens. We offer them separate training and stuff like the active shooter training and fire extinguisher training. We just, we switch it up throughout you know, like a three-year process, we offer these different types of training so there's always something out there for them to hone their skills. And while it may be geared towards those emergency preparedness coordinators, we open it up to everybody. And, you know, a lot of this stuff you can do in large auditoriums and, uh, you know, it, it draws the folks in. And whenever there's an incident, you know, that's a, a, a key time to just kind of reflect back of, say, hey, if that happened here, what would we do? And we've done that with some of our student groups as well, and that's engaged them. Um, and it, you know, it just, it has, just like your alert system it has to be multimodal. Thank you, Mark. 
Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today and serving as panelists. A lot of really great information and takeaways. We'd like to thank uh, everyone for joining us today as attendees. Um, I see we do have a handful of questions that we weren't able to get to. Uh, rest assured, we will follow up with you individually. Um, I would also like to say if there are additional questions following the webinar, feel free to email us at marketing at alertus.com. We'll be happy to answer and pass along any questions you may have. Um, I'd like to take just a quick minute to um, let all of our attendees know that we have a number of upcoming webinars that you can register for. Um, later on this month, we'll have an Alerta system overview that will focus on our digital signage and cable TV override. Um, in April, we'll have a session that focuses exclusively on our outdoor emergency notification solutions. And then in May, um, another Alerta system overview, this one focusing on the innovative text-to-speech text um, technology that we offer that works with a variety of emergency notification products and systems. You can register for any of those sessions at www.alertus forward slash alertus webinar series. And uh, for any additional information on us, our products, um, you know, go to our website at www.alertus.com. And finally, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, the session is being recorded. If you would like a link to the video recording, again, please email us at marketing at Thank you again for joining us and have a great afternoon.